Hi, this is Kevin Lin from Luminate LSAT, and in this lesson, we're going to cover one of the trickier concepts on the LSAT, inferences from multiple quantified statements. And I'm referring to a set of statements like this. Sometimes in a logical reasoning stimulus, you're going to get a bunch of statements that are quantified by words like all, most, some, and other variations of those words. And you'll be asked what we can infer, what must be true on the basis of those set of statements, or solving the problem will otherwise depend on your ability to recognize what are valid inferences and what are invalid inferences from multiple quantified statements. Now, if you're familiar at all with LSAT studying, you might know that a lot of courses handle this situation by diagramming, by mapping out these statements with arrows. That's not what this lesson is going to be about, because I want to give you a more conceptual understanding of how to make these inferences. I want to help you develop a solid foundation so that the diagramming formulas you might memorize later on become more intuitive and you can actually apply them in a timed situation. So let's get right into it. I like to think of inferences from multiple quantified statements as falling into two categories the overlap inference, and the transitive inference. Now, as you'll see later on, these categories are not necessarily mutually exclusive. There could be some examples that you view as falling into both categories, but I do think it's helpful to think about these inferences in two different ways. Let's start with the first type of inference, the overlap inference. This is an inference that you can make when you get a fact about one group and then you get another fact about members of that same group. For example, let's say we have a statement about pirates. All pirates have beards. Now, as you can see in a moment, we can represent the idea that all pirates have beards using a Venn diagram of sorts. The pirate group, which is this green square here, is going to be entirely contained within the group of people who have beards. Every single person who is in the pirate group is going to fall into the group of people who have beards. Now, we don't know how big the beard group is. This beard group could be extremely large. It could be very small. In fact, it could even be the exact same size as the pirate group. And in this world, the group of people who have pirates and the group of people who have beards are exactly the same. But we don't know that this has to be the case. All that we know with the statement all pirates have beards, is that the pirate group is, at a minimum, contained entirely within the beard group. Now we learn another fact about some pirates. Some pirates love to read. Now on the LSAT, some means at least one. So what this statement means is that at least one of these green pirates is going to fall into the group of people who love to read. So there you see a tiny portion that is falling both in the group that love to read and the group of pirates. Now, it's certainly possible that most of the pirate group falls within the love to read category. Maybe even all of the pirate group falls within the love to read category. But at a minimum, what this statement is saying is there's at least one person who is a pirate who falls into the love to read category. Do you notice that in this situation, there's an overlap between the beard group and the love to read group. And that's why we can conclude that there must be at least one person who has a beard who loves to read. Or in other words, some people who have beards love to read, or some people who love to read have a beard. How do we know that? Because there's gotta be at least one pirate in the world who has both of those qualities. So that's what I mean by an overlap inference. We started with a fact about all pirates, and then we learned something about some of those pirates. But let's change it up. What if instead of learning that some pirates love to read, we actually learned that most pirates love to read? And on the LSAT, most means over half. So anywhere from just over 50% of the pirate group is going to fall into the love to read group, all the way up to maybe even potentially all of the pirates love to read. But at a minimum, most means just over half. And so I'll make it just over half of the green group is inside the red group. Do you notice that there's still an overlap between some of the people who have beards and some of the people who love to read? So you can actually make the exact same conclusion that we made in the other example. 
Some people who have beards love to read, and some people who love to read have beards. Now, it's important to note that we actually cannot conclude that most people who love to read have beards, or that most people who have beards love to read, and that's because we just don't know how big these groups are. Do you notice that in this example, less than half of the beard group loves to read, and also less than half of the love to read group have beards? Now, it's certainly possible if one of these groups were smaller that you could start making most inferences or maybe even all inferences about the relationship between love to read and have beards. But the issue is we just don't know for sure. The only thing we know for sure is that at least some of the beard group loves to read and vice versa. Now let's say the world has implemented an enrichment program for young pirates designed to encourage them to read. And it's become so successful that every single pirate in the world loves to read. Every single one of the green group, the pirate group, falls within the love to read group. Do you notice that there is still an overlap between the beard group and the love to read group? That's why we can make the exact same conclusion. Some people who have beards love to read, and some people who love to read are beard havers. Again, you can't conclude a most or an all relationship here because you just don't know how big each of those groups are. So we've just talked about three different combinations of quantified statements. But do you notice that in a very fundamental way, they're actually just the same inference over and over and over? If we start off knowing a fact about all members of one group, in this case, all pirates have beards, and we learn another fact about that same group, whether it's just some, or most, or all, there is going to be an overlap between the beard group and the love to read group. There's going to be an overlap between the other two qualities. So what a lot of books and courses would have you memorize as three different formulas, three different examples, they really just boil down to the same inference. Now, it's important to note that when it comes to parallel reasoning or parallel flaw questions, there is a difference between an argument that is just based on some versus most versus all. So we do have to distinguish between what those words mean. But when it comes to understanding why we can make this kind of inference, I think it helps to just remember that they're essentially the same inference. Now, there's one more example of the overlap inference, and it's the only valid combination of quantified statements that does not involve an all statement. If we get a statement about most of one group, and then we get another statement about most of that same group, there's going to be an overlap inference that we can make. For example, let's say instead of knowing that all pirates have beards, now we only know that most pirates have beards, so that means over half of pirates have beards. And let's say that there are only nine pirates in the world, these nine green pirates. If most of these pirates have a beard, that means that at least half, so at least five of these pirates have a beard. And I'll go ahead and represent that like this. Five pirates fall within the beard-having category. Now let's say we learn that most pirates love to read, and that of course means at least five out of these nine pirates love to read over half. So here's what I'm gonna try to do. I'm gonna try to make at least five of these nine pirates love to read, because that's what most pirates love to read means. But I'm gonna try to separate the beard group from the love to read group as much as possible. Here's one, two, three, four, five. And do you see I have five out of nine pirates loving to read, Five out of nine pirates have beards, but there is going to be at least this one pirate in the world who has both qualities. That is why there is an overlap. I can still conclude that some people who love to read have beards, and some beard havers love to read. Now again, I can't conclude anything stronger than some, because I just don't know how big these groups are. As you can see, less than half of the beard group loves to read, and less than half of the love to read group has a beard. Now it's certainly possible that there's more of an overlap, but it just doesn't have to be true. And so there you have it. Those are the four ways that you can make the overlap inference. Either you're gonna get a statement about all members of one group, 
and then another statement about some, most, or all members of that same group. Or you're going to get two most statements about the same group. In these cases, you can conclude a some relationship between the two qualities possessed by some members of that underlying group. Now, before the end of this part of the lesson, I want to review two more points. The first point is something that I hope is pretty basic, but sometimes isn't, especially for students who are first starting out. And that is that the order in which we get the statements does not matter for the inferences that we can make. In all the examples that I've used earlier, I started with the all statement, and then we had another statement follows, some, most, or all. But clearly, you can just reorder these statements, and it doesn't change the underlying meaning. So if we start off knowing that some pirates love to read, and that all pirates have beards, that produces the exact same inference as if you started off with all pirates have beards, and some pirates love to read. The second point that you should be aware of is that when it comes to the overlap inference, you cannot conclude something stronger than some. You cannot conclude a most or an all unless the conclusion specifies the underlying group. For example, let's say we have the statement that all LSAT students are hardworking. And then we have the statement that all LSAT students binge watch Netflix. So here there's an overlap between the group of people who are hardworking and the group of people who binge watch Netflix. So that's why we can conclude that some people who are hardworking binge watch Netflix and some binge watchers of Netflix are hardworking. Now, sometimes people wonder, well, can't we conclude something stronger than that? Can't we conclude that all LSAT students who are hardworking binge watch Netflix or that all LSAT students are both hardworking and binge watch Netflix? And the answer is absolutely. But the reason that you're able to make that type of conclusion is because those statements specify the underlying group LSAT students. But if you want to make a conclusion that drops reference to the underlying group, and it's just about the other two qualities, you can't conclude most or all because you just don't know how big each of those groups really is. Now, the reason in this lesson I'm emphasizing this type of conclusion, the one that drops reference to LSAT students, the one that drops reference to pirates, is because that's the kind of inference that the LSAT is much more interested in and that appears much more often on the test. And that's also the kind of inference that's the least intuitive to see for most students. So don't assume that these are the only kinds of conclusions that you could ever make on the basis of these statements. That's not the point of this lesson. The point of this lesson is to emphasize a particular kind of inference that the LSAT likes to test and that is also relatively difficult to spot. Now that's it for part one of this lesson. Stay tuned for part two, where we'll talk about the other kind of inference that you can make from multiple quantified statements, and that is the transitive type of inference. We'll also talk about the reversibility of a sum statement and how that's important for making these types of inferences. And we'll finish with some big picture pointers for dealing with quantified statements in logical reasoning stimuluses.